Good evening. Welcome to uh, what I hate it when I can't. This is just my night. Welcome. And uh, thanks we for just changed the name. Me. It's not your fault. You want to say something else, but <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I'm used to saying something different. So you have a good point. Good evening. Welcome to uh, Uncivil Disobedience. I am Chris Richards. My co-host and partner in crime is, as always, the lovely and talented Kennedy Cooper. Hey, everyone. And our very special guest this evening are from the, the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign, uh, including its founder, Sherry Honkala, uh, original gangster activist and former vice presidential candidate for the Green Party in 2012. Happy to be here. I'm really it's glad to have you. <laughs> Really glad to have you. And I am going to go ahead and make sure that we are live on Twitter. I appreciate you joining us very much. Yeah, so uh, Sherry, um, what's going on in your world lately, politically? What's what's happening around you in your neighborhood? Well, uh, hopefully we won't be interrupted uh, during this podcast. Uh, as we grow closer to the 4th of July, uh, they literally don't uh, light off fireworks, but they light off explosives. Um, so if you hear loud things, <laughs> it's just explosives going off outside my window. Fun. Um, <laughs> I live in one of those. <laughs> or I, live in, I live in one of those wonderful places where people still fire guns in the air a whole bunch on New Year's Eve. Well, that that's a everyday thing around here. <laughs> Good point. Uh, it's New Year's Eve every day. Well, I, um, you know, I live in uh, ground zero uh, for the entire country for the drug uh, war. Uh, and literally, you know, my, my block is always, you know, has a bunch of criminologists and sociologists and <clears throat> in various different pub publications and stuff like that. Um, and uh, nobody asked me about the block. So it's good to be here <laughs> to have somebody ask of you about what's happening in my world around me, for God's sakes. Um, so, you know, we've been at this thing uh, doing housing takeovers for um, about 30 years. Um, we're kind of like um, some of the pioneers uh, in doing uh, housing takeovers. You know, we've been doing um, uh, many different uh, Zoom educationals on housing takeovers. Um, so we do like an introductory course and then people actually travel here and they see firsthand um, the activity that we're engaged in, but we really rely on podcasts, uh, and independent media, um, because while other folks take over like one house or two houses and that kind of stuff, um, you know, right now, uh, we're almost up to like 50 properties, uh, that we've taken over, uh, and you'll never see us on, uh, you know, any of the mainstream uh, publications in this country. So, yeah. And I, I, I wonder why that is. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just want to say, yes. yeah, I just want to say as someone who's done a little bit of squatting myself, uh, that uh, there's a lot of work involved in any kind of, takeover of a property and to have that many houses that you're working with that many properties that you're working with is actually that's incredible that's a a logistical feat unto itself and i applaud that yeah i mean it's a it's a hell of a lot of work um but uh you know we really think in 2021 um uh, there's an abundance and Philadelphia, there's 10 abandoned properties for every homeless person. Um, so we're tired of the mental masturbation and the sitting around and having another study, another workshop, 
uh, all of these things around the issues of homelessness. Uh, and so we think if, if people are serious about ending homelessness, one, uh, if you're facing foreclosure, just stay. Uh, and if you're homeless, uh, you know, we're recruiting into the poor people's army and house yourself. Um, and, you know, uh, it's very interesting that people that are not homeless, um, they'll recommend different, you know, waiting on waiting list, adjusting to lower standards of living, that kind of stuff, um, because they're not the ones that are having to live uh, in an inhumane way every single day, and just struggle for the basic necessities of life. And so um, we think it's really important to our strategy that people that are most impacted are in the forefront of a movement to end homelessness. I think that's important, yes. So we're, we're, we're using the term now, um, you know, we're the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign, um, but uh, to differentiate ourselves um, from some of the other groups that are out there that are more in the forms of, uh, let's say the nonprofit industrial complex, um, we're differentiating ourselves by calling ourselves the Poor People's Army. We don't take any money uh, from any corporations. And we're really, you know, I've been in this work for like 30 some years and we're just absolutely blown away at, um, you know, all of the, you know, fighters that are out there that have now begun to take money from Walmart, um, big corporate uh, foundations and all of those kinds of things. So um, it's a very interesting time in history right now. It, it really is. I don't think there's, and in this, this country is the only place in the whole world where that kind of open bribery just happens. <laughs> I mean, everywhere else in the world, even in countries where it happens, all the time, as much yeah. as it does here, just under the table instead of out in the open. Even in countries where it happens as much as it happens here, they hide the bribery. They want to make it look like something legitimate. They, they want to make all this stuff not look like it's just ending up in, in, in a politician's pocket. But here, we literally have a system that makes people millions and millions of dollars in donations. I think there were, I, I think it was over a billion dollars, two billion dollars, something like that, that was raised for the most recent election. Mm -hmm. More than that. And yeah. we spend all this money on buying the candidates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we just, um, uh, a young woman uh, from uh, Madison. Uh, just wrote her like doctoral thesis on um, the lack of media coverage uh, for third parties during um, presidential elections. And uh, it, I mean, it's not a surprise to any of us, <laughs> but I mean, it is just, you know, it, it, it's out of control. I mean, at least back in the day, we had some semblance of, of you know, independent media. Um, but now so many different media outlets um, are on corporate bankrolled um, outlets that uh, it makes it very difficult to you know, get out the truth or to get out um, the voice of people that are impacted by all of these issues. So I mean, you know, I mean, they they say right, if you don't have access to the media, um, then you really don't have a democracy anymore. And I really don't think that we have a democracy anymore. I don't really think we do. I mean, as far as as far as media that will get 
some of the real issues out there. I can't think of anything more than, you know, podcasts and YouTube shows and, um, you know, maybe Pacifica Radio. And, and, and that's it. Mm -hmm. I yeah, remember. I was actually on a progressive, uh, I won't say the name of it. I was actually on a progressive radio station and, and on the progressive radio station, um, they received money from Wells Fargo. So they didn't want me to talk about Wells Fargo. Um, and, you know, families that were facing foreclosure uh, when the foreclosure crisis first hit. So, I mean, that's how low this thing has stooped. <laughs> I, I think what one thing that distresses me too is I see an increasing tendency that even this media space is like something that we're not allowed to have as our own. I mean, the Obamas make podcasts now. Like everybody makes a podcast now. And Everybody's it just feels really good. like I just feels like a, they're, they're trying Michael, to flood our spaces. Michael Cohen has a podcast. Ridiculous. Yeah, it's it, it just it feels like you know, a couple of years ago when you tuned into the podcast channels, even if some of the people were bought out, at least they were small time and bought out. But now it's like the biggest names you can imagine are flooding our spaces and making it harder and harder for us to compete in places that used to be like one of the only places that we had as smaller creators that works kind of our own. And why do they need to take it over? They have everything. Obama can go on MSNBC anytime he wants. Barack Obama could just pick up the phone and go, hey, can I be on MSNBC tonight? And they would so, go, yep. How so, long do you want? Half hour? Hour? Two hours? So what do you want? This, is, this is what happens with a medium like podcast. Comic books used to be like this. You have these mediums that are either the very lowbrow and everybody looks down on them in every way, or the very highbrow where everyone points at it and says, this is art. Mm -hmm. And and so in, with podcasts, you've got all these nobodies who are just like us who are just trying to get our stuff out there mm -hmm. however we can. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we need to have a nobody show every day uh, because <laughs> yeah. we, we got some serious invisibility going on. Um, and, you know, I, I work with a colleague. His name is Galen Tyler. And he says all the time, you know, that, that the whole world is looking over here when the real stuff is happening over here. <laughs> and that's a big part of our work. Um, and I think, you know, that's one of the things that Shimako is doing uh, with the Poor People's Army is trying to get, you know, everybody that's looking whoops, over here to start looking over here. Uh, it's it's some it's a hell of a, a, you know, swimming upstream kind of process going. On. Right, Shamak? Well, I mean, it's funny you're talking about like uh, the consolidation of media and like the different rounds of this that takes place. And I remember, like, uh, you know, Sherry and I, we started working together 15 years ago. And, you know, you're, you're a couple, what is that, 2005, 2006. You're about eight years in, um, coming off of the Telecommunications Act, right? So you're starting to see the consolidation of radio at that point. Um, but you still have a decent amount of public radio. You still have a decent amount of college radio. And even that's, like, difficult to get access to now, right? Um and, you know, it's funny because, you know, you're talking about, like, the podcast and, like, why does Obama need a podcast? And, and, and you know, it, it, isn't, it isn't even so much that they have them, right? It's that they create them and then all of the forces that be, like, push them to the forefront of everything, right? And, and not necessarily because they're great content or because it's something that you need to know. It's a brand, right? It's a brand, and it's it's marketable, and it's familiar. And meanwhile, people are dying, and they don't care. Almost, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every, not just, not even just hosts now. Almost every contributor on MSNBC, from Chuck Rosenberg on the, I used to be the the deputy director of the, I used to be in charge of what was it? 
I used to be in charge of counterintelligence for the FBI before he was an he was a, a, a U.S. attorney and or whatever. And then on the other hand, Michael Cohen. And, and now I work for the news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, but everybody from Chuck Rosenberg to Michael Cohen has a podcast. From Barack Obama to Michael Cohen. So, but when they introduce their contributors now, they're not just saying, well, this is Chuck Rosenberg who, who used to work at the FBI and was the, the deputy attorney general and was in the Bush White House. No, no. They say, this is Chuck Rosenberg and he hosts a podcast. <laughs> Jerry, I, I, I think I think we need to tell the campaign story. <laughs> I, it, I, I mean, it's it's relevant, right? Like, uh, um, uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you guys know that Sherry was, you know, vice presidential candidate. With yes, Jill Stein, and um, you know, the the Green Party in and of itself, you know, like pretty much any party that isn't the Democrats or the Republicans, um, has has struggled to get, um. Like a reasonably, I want to say fair. I don't even know if fair is the right word. Like, like kittens. Like, you know, like, like even like mercy coverage. You know, um, and it's funny, I was right? Because, like, no, because the mainstream media will give the Green Party no coverage, and then like, like, like the Russia Today will cover them, and they'll be like, oh my gosh, Russia Today covered this. Them, right? This cycle, <laughs> but it's not this it's not like cycle. NBC is rushing to get in line. You know what I mean? Well, but that's the thing. This cycle, MSNBC had Howie Hawkins on Morning Joe for like five to ten minutes tops. And it, it was a really good little bit. It went really, really well. But let's let's just take MSNBC puts Howie Hawkins on at the butt crack of dawn on their most conservative show. That's a bunch of Beltway people hanging out and gossiping about other Beltway people, essentially. So it's the absolute worst venue you could possibly put a third-party candidate who, who you're trying to get attention to. Yeah, I mean, many people still to this day... Um, don't know that, you know, Jill and I were basically made to, uh, on the day of the debates, um, we weren't allowed to be a part of the debates um, because the ten corporations make the decisions about who gets to be a part of the debates. But Jill and I, we disappeared um, by secret service, uh, not our families, nobody from our campaign. And it was, it happened here in the United States of America. And we were on you know, over 85% of the country could vote for us because we were on the ballots. And that's a lot of people. <laughs> and millions of dollars were donated from these lots of people. Uh, and then we were just made to disappear and, you know, you know, spent all night and to early in the morning in a warehouse. Um, you know, and our our children couldn't know where we were. You know, it's just like, you know, they could have just wiped us off the face of the but, earth. But we live in a democracy, and 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 it's just so good that the the the, the things that Putin does don't happen here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, we're so we're so safe. <laughs> we're so safe. I live in Oregon. We are so safe. <laughs> that a that a man with a license to carry a firearm who shoots a white supremacist in self defense at a black lives matter protest can be hunted down and murdered by the federal government mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not tried to arrest him. they didn't try to arrest him they murdered him yeah yeah uh, yeah, and and you know it's it's interesting, man. You know we, when we talk about like um, not just not just corporate ownership of the media, right? Because I mean, obviously that's that's a thing, um, but also like um, the 
the, the sort of the current polarization that's taking place right now, right? Yeah. And you know, I, I don't I don't know if either of you two were like uh, like Obama people. Um, uh, I was I was never a big Obama dude. Uh, when when Obama started running, uh, I wrote an article called "Barack is the new OJ." Um, I, I felt like uh, people were really. I mean, and I and I feel like my like my mom was super excited. She was super excited about having a black president, and as an as an elder who really genuinely believed that that was never going to happen in the country, I'm I, I'm 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 a hundred percent with her, right? And you know, I knew it was a new a, ne- a neoliberal pushing a, pushing a particular agenda. Um, there were a lot of people who came out of his campaign super disillusioned. You know, um, you know, you went from from that into Hillary. Um, that was an interesting little ride, and of course, you know, we, you know, we ended up with Trump, and and then you know, you get you get into Biden, and kind of as all of this process is taking place, you know, you have Bernie, and and you start to see like the emergence of an of an increase of like socialist, uh, communist consciousness, if we can call it that, right? And we sure um, can. and it's uh, it's. It's so obvious on the ground floor what's happening, right? And there's and there's such an extreme effort to avoid it, <laughs> you know. Um, but I mean, it's out there. Like you know, one one one. I mean, one of the reasons we reached out to your show. It's I mean, it's out there. You know, um, uh, you know, being on the 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 Fred Hamptons leftist. It's it's out there, and you know, so is um, so is the fascist wing of it, right? Yes. Like that, that, that extreme is out there as well. And, and what's funny is they don't even bother hiding it. <laughs> they, like they're, they don't even like pretend, you know, just, they pre yeah. they pretend in, in certain ways, but not really. Like, I mean, like will they'll say things like, well, we don't think anybody's inferior to anyone else. No, but you still want to kill them. Right. Well, Yeah. Well then, does it matter? Right, <laughs> and and they don't have an answer for that yet. Yeah, but it's just, but but that's true. And and what's more is when 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 that kind of movement really started to make a comeback, and people didn't cover it like, oh, this is so horrible. People covered it like, why are these people Nazis? What's making people be Nazis? We need to study these people and learn about them so we can figure out why they're Nazis. And that media coverage to understand Nazis, even though it's done in a way of saying this is clearly a bad thing, it makes people more interested in it exposes people to the message and makes them more interested in it and increases the chance that someone's going to hear this white supremacist say something on TV and then say to themselves, Hmm, maybe I'm a Nazi too. And that wouldn't have even happened if it weren't for the media wanting to understand the Nazis. Well, and I think also the liberals have this delusion a lot of the time that this uh if you drag them out into the open it ruins their lives and it you know it ends the problem so to speak um which is like there can be an aspect of truth to that but the reality is a lot of times when these stories come out it 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 means like okay whatever person they profiled they get kicked out of their housing or something because their landlord finds out they're renting to a nazi uh something like that happens so maybe like that specific person experiences like a moment of hardship. Generally what happens next is like Tucker Carlson posts their fundraiser um, and they, they get like $500,000. Um, uh, also what happens is that all the people who see that person be victimized think, wow, the whites really are being persecuted like he said. And it builds even more sympathy for the in the people that- you know what? they're trying to reach. So even if that one person gets kicked out of their house or whatever, it's creating more Nazis and, to platform and, them. It doesn't and, matter if you ruin that one person's life. 
and and you just put your finger on something because they they that one person's life may be ruined for a little while, but then it gets fixed. And the people who fix it are still respectable. I mean, Clarence Thomas's wife paid for a bus to bring people to Washington, D.C. to storm the Capitol building. Well, and he's well, still on the Supreme Court. Well, yeah, and 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 I also think that you guys pinpointed kind of what I was trying to get at, right? Yeah. Because on because on 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 this side of the equation, you know, somebody gets put on blast, but they're getting put on blast becomes a public conversation. They might lose their home, but they gain a million dollars in a GoFundMe, right? And here and you know, we're talking about housing takeovers, right? And like just the just the struggle to, I mean, because you you know you take that same equation and apply it to the ten million people who can't afford to pay rent this month, right? Um, you apply it to all of the people who had to struggle through and are struggling through the pandemic, trying to decide if they're going to be able to pay their medication or pay a, a utility bill or pay for some food. Right. And like how many of those stories really make it into the, into the realm of like the mainstream media conversation, if any, right. Everybody, everybody that they've had on MSNBC to talk about how the pandemic impacted them, who was an ordinary person was a small business owner or a professional or, or, or even in one case, a low level millionaire. And these are the ordinary people who, who, who are sharing their, their stories with us all in the mainstream media. They don't acknowledge I mean, they talked about essential workers, but when when have you seen the guy at Burger King on MSNBC to talk about how the pandemic's affecting him? <clears throat> well, they certainly didn't talk about, uh, you know, people dying, being where, warehoused in homeless shelters across this country um, or having to adjust to, uh, adjust to a lower standard of living uh, by piling up uh, in a safer place, which would have been like an individual encampment. Um, and, you know, the conversation always is around those kinds of things, but it's not about like about resistance and getting organized to take back the basic necessities of life. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, and, you know, we're trying to uh, move away from what the nonprofit world wants us to do, which is to, you know, get in these fights about who's got the best seat on the Titanic. Um, and instead, you know, we're clear uh, that, you know, uh, the fight is about globalizing from below um, and getting organized and, um, you know, participating in moving this boulder earth cross cross shift uh, in the way that we look at things um, because it's literally like they have us on some kind of like sedation sedated drugs or something where we're sitting around the table and we're busy talking about things as if it's like 1960 or the 70s um, <laughs> but this is 2021 and you know, whether it's uh, people died because of the inequality around health care, whether people died because um, of the, you know, more people dying from the opiate crisis than did Vietnam, um, you know, whatever it is. And, and, you know, just watching brothers and sisters in India dying only because they don't have access, um, you know, I mean, we've really got to fight like hell to make sure that, um, you know, that shows like this get some play, that they get shared, that people talk about these kind of things because, um, 
Um, I might not be black, um, but I have no illusion of security. And I know um, that if I'm not exploitable, I'm absolutely expendable. And they don't give two dams about my uh, sons <laughs> or my grandchildren. Well, maybe they care about them right this minute, but later down the line. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the most challenging thing that we have right now is uh, there's so many people, guys. We've been doing this for a long time. And like you said, takeover work is a lot of hard work. But it's crazy because we have so many people doing the wrong work. Um, and yes, I dare to say it's the wrong work. Uh, this is not, you know, we cannot be, you know, collecting paychecks and getting, you know, 95 workshops. Um, this is a, like, how do we feed, clothe, and house our troops so that they can stay awake towards, you know, by the end of the next week? <laughs> uh, or not go to prison. You know what I mean? Because we know that at any given point, they could be like, okay, you guys are going to get the smackdown. And worse than that is nobody's going to know about it in the whole country. Uh, because we've designated the national leaders around poverty and homelessness and housing. And, um, uh, you know, you sound, you know, you guys sound more like revolutionaries. Uh, so we are not going to give you no play. Um, and we're not hiding it. Um, why can't we have as many young people in this country that, you know, mobilized around making sure that the peasants in Chiapas weren't knocked off the face of the earth and developed a net war strategy? That's what the poor people's army needs. That's what... That's what the a lot of people in American politics need right now because nobody's speaking up for us. I mean, as soon as I don't want to sound like I'm trashing Bernie Sanders, I still love Bernie Sanders. He 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 changed a lot of people's thinking in some ways, even if he's not everything he's cracked up to be. And changing people's thinking is tremendous important if people do not have a conception that something is possible they won't fight for it and Bernie Sanders was really starting to convince people that things were possible which is why Biden is trying so hard to convince everybody they're not and why Joe Manchin is sitting why we have Joe Manchin sitting there in the Senate blocking everything there are 10 people hiding 10 12 15 people may be hiding behind Joe Manchin and saying, I'm glad he's doing this so I don't have to. And he's too convenient. You you remember that during this, during this primary season, Chuck Schumer picked the people he wanted to run against Republicans to take back the Senate. And the people he picked were the worst. I mean, I don't think anybody here is a big cheerleader for the Democratic Party in the first place. But when you pick Jerry, the worst... Jerry actually loves the Democratic Party. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, found that Green, I found that Green Party, that former Green Party candidates always love the Democratic Party. He's just fan. A, He's fan. <laughs> but no, so I'm not a fan of the Democratic Party in the first place, but the people that... that Chuck Schumer chose to run for the Senate were the worst possible Democrats he could have picked. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, John Hickenlooper. John Hickenlooper. Amy. Oh, my gosh, that's Amy. Not, that's, not, that's not even a good name. <laughs> he looks like Skeletor, isn't that, too. Isn't that a candidate thing? Like, having a good, I'm sure that's a strong candidate name. Like, like I don't, I don't hear Hickenlooper and think leader. That's just me. I would change my name. I, I would. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but I just, you know, just just building off what both Sherry and and Chris sort of sort of brought to the table. 
there are no indications. I mean, I don't know if you guys heard about this, but like Jeff Bezos, I guess he's like going to space or whatever, right? Yeah. I hope he stays. Yeah, yeah. There's no indication that this thing's changing direction anytime soon, right? Like Bezos is going to space. Like the far right's trying to shut down the vote, right? Like, like cats are just trying to eat and have a place to sleep, you know. So, and and you know, I I I think one of the things that you know, like Sherry's pointing to, and that's a, a big part of the the poor people's army's composition. And and I think Chris, this is kind of what you're pointing to as well, right? Like, it it it, it is important to have people who like create hope or who create possibility. But it's increasingly clear that, like, taking it to the finish line mm -hmm. is really going to come down to the people. Mm -hmm. It's really going to come down. It's really going to come down to you and I, because yeah. because waiting on the waiting on the Democratic Party, waiting on the nonprofit industrial complex, waiting on the intake form, um, you know, um, um, waiting on the funding to come through. If how 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 is if these things are working how is wealth becoming more polarized <laughs> right like like if these things are working why does it feel like poor and working people are continuing to lose i'm glad you asked that i'm glad yeah. you asked that and, they are and stealing from us <laughs> they are putting their hands right into our pockets not literally but it's what they're doing and they are yanking our money right out. Yeah. And they are giving it to the richest people in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember one time um, uh, I, I was a guest uh, in Finland and there was, you know, all these, you know, different representatives from different social movement groups and that kind of stuff. And, uh, the president of Finland was there and they had us at this beautiful place. And then they asked me if I wanted to stay there on like a six month sabbatical. <laughs> and I know that if I would have stayed, um, I don't know if I could have ever come back. Yeah. Um, because, uh, and the reason I say this is because, um, you know, one of the best things about living in Kensington and living on the front lines and, you know, hearing the gunfire every day and, uh, you know, getting ordained online just so I can bear, bury people um, so that the faith community doesn't exploit people and charge them left and right to bury them. Um, I, I am able uh, to stay clear um, because I'm in the boxing ring and um, I just feel like, you know, in this country, we don't need the tanks going down the street. We just have to turn on television and, um, you know, we'll see a different reality uh, other than what's happening outside their window. And it's a little harder to deny that reality when it's outside your window. And, and, and you're right about, you're right about how, if you're not in touch with what's really happening, mm -hmm. that you get sucked out of it. Because no less a personage than Noam Chomsky, who co-wrote Manufactured Consent, who said every president deserves to be hanged, who, who, who said, you know, you there really isn't any fundamental difference for the most part between the two political parties. Even he bought into this, you got to vote for Biden or, or we're going to have fascism. And that's not how it works. No, because I would argue that. fascism is here. Well, and, here. Well, let's, say, let's say you don't we think have fascism, children. fascism is here. Oh, I agree we with you. We have children in cages. Yeah. Border still oh. to this day. And they're. Oh, for, for every person, for every person 
who said that Biden was going to be at least a tiny, tiny improvement over Trump, or at least would stop things from getting worse. So there was a concentration camp in Homestead, Florida, which the Trump administration shut down because, I'm going to use the words that were used by the contractor who ran, the, who runs the concentration camp, there was a serious problem with staff on child sex, which is to say that kids were being raped by the staff at the Homestead concentration camp. Trump and his administration closed it down because they were of the opinion, whatever other problems they might have had, that kids being raped by the fed by people being paid by the federal government was not good and they had to do something about it and joe biden opened that concentration camp up again and left the same contractor in charge of it they didn't even change the contractor i also know that i mean during biden's campaign there was an entire a uh, huge encampment. He had his national headquarters here in Philadelphia and the entire homeless encampment existed, you know, right outside his, you know, national headquarters. Um, and somehow uh, really scares me that people continue to, you know, this lesser of two evils thing, right? Uh, you know, a campaign getting money from a corporation is a campaign getting money from corporations, period. <laughs> We've got to catch up with the rest of the world. The rest of the world, like Finland has, you know, 15 different political parties. Uh, and we still just have Pepsi and Coke. And more and more Pepsi and Coke taste the same. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I, I just think um, both of you touched a little bit on like how, you know, it's easy to get detached from stuff and how people run a, like kind of run away from the reality of things. And I, I think it's really important that we confront that more because I think speaking from my own experiences with poverty and, you know, being in poverty basically my whole, entire life uh, and still am and most of my friends and family are and et cetera. Um, it seems to me it's not just something that people are running away from in a real sense. Sure, sometimes people are offered an opportunity to physically run away from it. But like a lot of people just seem to be we're just hiding from our own poverty, denying that it exists, you know, pretending that it's not there. And I can't blame anyone to an extent from running from poverty because it's awful. And like, you know, I'm doing it too. So I get it. But but at the same time, I think we need to be a little more honest about that because when we're constantly pretending that like we're we're better than off than we are, things are going better than they are, we're not as desperate as we are, we're buying into that whole system. And I think it, it helps to make us complacent in these false forms of change because we want to believe that, you know, this system is working and we're a part of it. And we're lagging behind a little right now, but we're going to catch up. You'll see, you know, like it's- The rest of the world is yeah. backsliding to, to where we are. And it takes it even a step crazier because like myself doing this kind of work, um, then the assumption is um, that I've taken an oath to poverty, um, that I am, uh, uh, that I am participating in the nonprofit industrial complex model those are absolutely the opposites of what we're talking about. So that's why we're using this. And, and, I, and just to jump in on that, and I apologize for turning my camera off, but transparently I'm, I'm driving, so I'm, I'm already riding the edge right now. But um, understand, you know, uh, I, I was I was on a uh, I was on a clubhouse conversation. Clubhouse is like my new thing. You guys, you guys ever use clubhouse? I do. I, I Sherry doesn't know what really what clubhouse is, but. Do either used to use Clubhouse? I'm a member. <laughs> but you're never on it. <laughs> right. I, no, I, I haven't a, used Clubhouse very much, no. Yeah, yeah. 
so so I, I just I just started getting um kind of into it, and um, you know, we were I, we were having this conversation, and somebody was making the point that um, you know, a lot of a lot of uh like pundit like political pundits and intellectuals and organizers aren't really a part of the community. And like he, he quoted, he, he quoted a union organizer. He didn't have the person's name. And you know, to, that, that's a, that's a very real thing, but there's a flip side to that, which is that there are a lot of organizations that are on the block that are in the communities that are doing the work, um, you know, that, that are not grifting 40, $50 million, but you don't really hear about it. Right. And so, you know, when Sherry's talking about like the vow of poverty, it's not that she has, she's taking a vow of poverty. It's that nobody even knows what they're like, what they're doing. Nobody even knows what we're doing. And, you know, like people hear about it and they're like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. You guys are you guys you guys are um, you guys are totally under federal watching your lives are in danger all the time. That's cool. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, and then like you, you get a flashy meme or whatever. And it's like, oh, let's give that person ten thousand um, dollars. And, you know, like uh, coming back to Kennedy's point about poverty, because because I think it's related. Like we're not we're not talking about everybody like um, having meat coats and driving uh, Teslas. Right. Like we're just talking about basic things like a reasonable degree of health care and access to food and like maybe education. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be really nice. <laughs> I yeah. like all those things. And and I think that most uh, nonprofits or whatever are set up so that um, the whole goal is to pay for the, you know, two and a half people. Um, and that's it. <laughs> and, you know, so... Uh, what we're trying to do is trying to teach people um, that we've got to create this new independent alignment um, where all of us together, we either sink or swim. And we really do create this, you know, uh, you know, I ran one of my campaigns I ran for, I ran for state rep. And in six weeks, I raised $100,000. And that $100,000 were $20 increments. Um, so the, the, the point that I'm raising is, is that um, we as people in this country that are tired of these conditions, that know that these two corporate control political parties don't give a damn about us, we have to create a different path. And that's not going to be through, you know, foundation grants. You know, there's this line that they say all the time about Harriet Tubman. She didn't say, you know, first let's uh, write a foundation grant and then let's seek freedom. <laughs> and, and so we are, you know, every day we know that um, any one of us can be taken out of the picture and locked up. And we know, you know, anytime I get a call in the middle of the night, I think, you know, somebody's coming to evict 30 families or 40 families or 50 families. Um, and we're going to have to deal with that. Um, and then, you know, you know, we're thankful for some of some of the members of the National Lawyers Guild um, who, you know, are willing to step forward and be helpful and that kind of stuff. And then we've also had, um, a, an amazing attorney by the name of Connor, um, who is actually pro bono representing some of our, our some of our families in federal court, um, around basically saying, you can't just kick these families out and have no place for them to go. Um, and so we don't care if people look at us like we're crazy or whatever, uh, but we're preventing a greater harm. And that's one of keeping people alive. And, and we're, we, you know, we're prepared to go to jail if we have to. It, when the world has gone mad, 
if everybody is looking at you telling you you're crazy, you're probably the only sane one in the room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's unbelievable the the degree of schizophrenia and sociopathy mm -hmm. that are pushed on us as normal and sane by the media. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to believe things even when they're the opposite of each other mm -hmm. in sequence when they want us to believe them because, well, this is what we're saying now. But yeah, but five years ago, you said, well, don't ignore five years ago. Five years ago didn't really happen. You're imagining it. Mm -hmm. And it's just, people stand around now talking about how, oh, well, we wish at least Trump was more like George Bush. And, and then there are already a few people, quote unquote, normal liberal people who have said, well, you know, you've got to at least give Trump credit for and then throw something out there. Mm -hmm. So they're already starting to normalize their supposed blood enemy. Yeah. <laughs> supposed. Yes. Yeah, and, 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 and I think, you know, part of what you're pointing to is that is that the politics don't really have like an ethical or moral root, right? Like it's, it's, it's that's really like, where I'm getting at. Yes. Yeah. It's 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 really like sports teams, right? And and you and you might and you might hate a you might hate a player when they're on, when they're on your um when they're when they're on your arch nemesis team like you're like oh man but you know like what I bet you if like if Trump became a Democrat tomorrow there'd be so many people who are like who'd be like vote Trump. Well, <laughs> I, I I hated Trump yesterday, but. I know. Well, remember. Well, no, let's take it one step further because we actually did this hypothetical scenario on Not Safe for Wonks a while back. And we imagined that uh, Logan Paul was running for president as a Republican and that he was shitting on people's desks and like flinging it at people and, mm -hmm. you know, literally just doing actual, like, just vile. Uh -huh. Like, you know, punching people in the face, stabbing people, shooting people, whatever, because he's just a, you know, he, he we all know what he's like if you've ever seen him in the media. He's just a, a, a ridiculous yeah, weirdo love, love, person. A uh, guy who fought Floyd Mayweather to a draw. Yeah, that guy. Whatever. Yeah, so like, we're imagining, oh, he's running for president as a Republican, but oh, it's okay because... Ivanka Trump is running as the Democrat and we're all going to pull behind the Trumps. You remember how Trump used to be civil? He used to take his opponents and just bash them in a tweet. Not like Logan Paul throwing his actual feces at people. Like that's what the Democrats are going to do to us. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I mean, that's a, that's a, and I, and I think as the, as the material conditions become more serious, as the political environment becomes more polarized, you know, especially moving into the end of the midterms um, and then into the into the next presidential election and whatever happens between now and then, hmm. you know, this this space like this space of people who are who are because I, I think I think it is worth noting there are a lot of people. There are a lot of people that we consider like like Trump people. Who are actually just people who are disenfranch who are disenchanted with the elites, right? Um, and don't know where to put that. Like they just don't have a place to put that, you know. And it's it's difficult to even find the right way to talk about it because the 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 mainstream public conversation is so watered down, right? Well, so I mean, it you really is. Medicare for all. What is it like at seventy five percent? Or seven yeah. percent, yeah, like most and, of America. <laughs> you know? But despite those numbers, despite seventy-five percent of America supporting Medicare for all, mm -hmm. DSA believes that they have to 
get people canvassing door to door for Medicare for all instead of pressuring politicians. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, they got people elected, but they don't think that it's right to pressure them to represent the people who got them elected. Um, I always laugh anytime I hear anyone start talking about what if we did a public awareness campaign for Medicare for all? And I hate to say it, but even very nice, likable organizers who aren't affiliated with any questionable orgs even talk this way from time to time. And I'm like, we don't need to tell anybody anything. That part's fine. <laughs> Everybody wants health care. What? There's no like magical, like, oh, we're going to put up a website and suddenly... Uh, everyone's going to realize that they really, really want health care this time. <laughs> I mean, well, I think we should invest a bunch that's, of- that's, that's an important point, right? But I mean, I think it does, of course, beg the question, and maybe this is an obvious question. And the obvious question is if everybody wants it, why don't we have it? The same well, thing with housing. So the same well, thing with housing. The, 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 the will, same thing with everything. I will dare suggest an answer. I have one too. <laughs> but what would happen if you two don't cover it enough? I'll give one too. What would happen if we pass Medicare for all tomorrow and everyone had health care? How would DSA raise money? How would the politicians for whom Medicare for all? has been their breadwinner, how would they raise money? If the problem's solved, sure, you can remind us you solved it for a little while and get reelected off that, but then somebody realizes they have another problem and you still haven't figured out how to get everybody's attention yet and how to drag it out for another 10 years of milking it for good money. Because let's be honest, the point of this incrementalism that's practiced by the Democratic Party is to slow things down to a crawl so that everybody can get the most possible benefit out of it, while at the same time, minimizing the damage for the ruling class. And that's exactly what's, what's, what's happening. Was that everybody else's theory? <laughs> was that everybody else's theory? Well, I have mine. No. <laughs> well, my, my theory, my, my theory is, um, you know, we live in a country with abundance. I'm saying pretty much the same stuff that Chris is saying, that's Kenny Kennedy is saying that if we just develop the political will, get organized, take back or reclaim the, all this stuff that should be ours, it's done. We live happily ever after. We go through the storm, we get to the other side. But right now, at this time in history, they are going to uh, slander they are going to cut off the voice they are going to create a bunch of parking tickets they're going to rebring up your student loans they are going they are vicious the democrats are absolutely vicious i'm speaking from experience of course on all of this <laughs> right. say out loud hey. that all of this is just to slow down the process and the individuals that are, you know, the ones standing around that can afford to have this incremental process are not the ones that are going out on the street tomorrow, are not the woman that has a kid that has cancer that is being thrown out on the streets in Philly is not the guy that is dying of AIDS that doesn't have access to housing, um, is not the mother, the grandmother who lost her house in a fire. Um, that's not who these people are. 
And so we have, we've got to get away from this. And it's, I mean, I think 2021 is going to be the year where the line is drawn. And if you're not in the boxing ring, then people shouldn't be telling us how to punch. If this stuff does not have direct impact on your life, get the hell away from me. It's like uh, the Queen song. Um, <laughs> I'm going to find me a future. Get out of my way. That's right. <laughs> and if you're if you're not here to help, either get out of the way or stand there so I can hit you too. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, an old, an old quote from Frederick Douglass who didn't talk about going to court yet again to try once more to repeal the, the Fugitive Slave Act because he knew that the Supreme Court hadn't stayed, changed much and they were we're still going to do the same thing they had done the last time. So he said, if we want to make the Fugitive Slave Act a dead letter, we got to make a few dead kidnappers. They do not teach you about that part of Frederick Douglass in school when they mention his name briefly. It's important to keep that in mind. They whitewash everybody, every person in history who has tried to make other people in this country more free has been whitewashed to get all the rough edges off them and to deny that they ever advocated or excused or justified anything like violence. Bill Clinton had the nerve to say during the presidential election that they thought too many people had been, been acting like Stokely Carmichael and not enough people had been acting like Martin Luther King Jr. Right? I, I I don't think Martin Luther King would have liked Bill Clinton very much. That's all I can say. Because what he's what he's really saying is that Martin and would never admit to this, but what he's really saying is Martin Luther King Jr. got shot and Stokely Carmichael didn't. Yeah, I mean, you were gonna say something, Shamako? Yeah, no, I was just I was gonna tell the the the, the Stokely the, the Stokely Carmichael comment. I mean, it, you know, I, I I I used to have a tradition. Um, I'm 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 probably gonna bring it back, but uh, every every MLK day, uh, I I used to I used to send out the letter from Birmingham jail. Yes. Um, and you know, just when, when everybody's talking about I have a dream, you know, let's let's talk about when he was behind bars and he was like, Hey, um, I don't think some of y'all are really about this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're out here talking about I'm 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 going too far. And you know, like and, and he you know, he was calling and he was calling out the same people we're calling out today. It's the same it's the what? same exact people, you know? Yep. And it's and it's funny because, like as 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 accessible as the letter for Birmingham jail is, you don't ever hear anybody read that. In, like, every now and then, <laughs> you know what I mean? every like, now and then, somebody pulls it out. Yeah, but 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 very, but very, like you, I mean, you know, you mentioned like um, you know, like Obama's never going to read that. No, it, no, yeah. definitely not. <laughs> you know, not Bill Clinton. Clinton. You know I mean? Not Hillary. That's not going to be on the Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton podcast. No. Okay, Day. But I mean, it was, it was, and and even in terms of St Stokely Carmichael, right? Like, just from a movement perspective, even if they had some tactical disagreements, they were still trying to find their place with each other, right? Yep. Well, yeah. I mean, so let's let's keep in mind that. Martin Luther King Jr. was nonviolent. And Deacons for Defense was not nonviolent. They wore guns and 
walked around very publicly so that people could see the bulges in their jackets so that they knew that the black folks were armed at this civil rights meeting. And Martin Luther King had deacons for defense bodyguards because he knew people were trying to kill him. I... It's all such a mess. All I can really say is whenever I, any anytime a, a, a white person, really any white person, but especially a white politician says some ridiculous shit about MLK, all I can, I can ever think of is uh, that, that song from the early 2000s by Aaron Carter, How I Beat Shaq. <laughs> like, it's just like, that's what it feels like to me. Just like, uh, just like <laughs> you're just saying something ridiculous and you're expecting me to believe that there's some, there's some veracity to this story. Uh, but, uh, but I know you can't beat that guy in basketball. Come on. You didn't beat Shaq. We know you <laughs> Yeah. But, <laughs> and, and I think the other thing is that, you know, without being like a, um, without being a class reductionist about things, I think one of the other things it does is it, it, re it removes the spaces Right. When you, when you, so you're talking about I have a dream and content a character, right? But it it, re, it removes the spaces of like the the entire like structural critique that MLK actually had of capitalism. Yes. Again, which was which was which was central to his work. Yes. You know, and I mean it was <laughs> like you can't even do like a base level of research on him without that coming up. You know. Well, no, yeah. I mean, Martin Luther King was suspected of being a communist by the FBI. Uh, they were calling him up, telling him to kill himself because they were convinced in their own little heads that, that civil rights was a Soviet plot. But but this kind of making up history is like, it's part of the fabric of American character at this point. It's I mean, true. think about it. It, it. It's It's in our religion. You know how uh, Americans interpret the Bible is just like this made up, like points on a map thing that no one could possibly follow. How we interpret a lot of history is the same way, and so it feels like yeah, like people should just be able to look this up and figure this out. But actually, that's not something that we're culturally capable of. I don't know. <laughs> well. It's, it's, hard I mean, to we are to an extent, but it's just like it's just ingrained to people not, it's just to, to, to just take whatever version of it profits you most, run with that, never look further into it. That's why I think there's something to be said about, um, you know, us just making sure that we, um, uh, that we lift up and we talk about the real lessons in history. Um, many people by and large that are probably watching this don't even know about the deacons um, whatsoever. Um, uh, the, the other thing is, is I think that um, there's a lot to be said about um, uh, the capturing of oral history uh, working class oral history and how to use that as a way to, um, you know, teach truth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you know, start reading, you know, slave narratives. Start reading, uh, you know, uh, the workers out on, a, you know, a union strike and they're writing their own narrative. Um but that goes back to what you both have been talking about, which is, you know, this lack of critical thinking, uh, a lack of following the dollars. Um, it's this assumption that the ruling class um, is not busy 24 seven trying to create social control and um, making sure that we're not talking about the real stuff that we have to be talking about. And, you know, be afraid of anything that gets lots of attention out there. <laughs> Chances are uh, the ruling class wants you to hear about this or that, and it has nothing to do with anything. Uh, and it's like busy mind work. Um, and we have to, you know, be about the business of ha helping our folks begin to, you know, 
before we can have any kind of class unity, we have to have some kind of class identity. And um, you're not going to get that from watching television. <laughs> it's true. I mean, the Kardashians. <laughs> so y'all know that the Kardashians, the, 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 that um, Kim and Chloe, yeah, Kim and Chloe started their first business because they stole from their employer, who was Lady Gaga. Oh wow! <laughs> they, 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 they. Maybe you're going to get some followers. Kim had some sort of job as a stylist or or <laughs> consultant or something like that, and she was literally overbilling and embezzling and stealing and use that money to start her business with Chloe. And that was where their, and their family was rich in the first place. Why did they need to steal from someone? I don't know. I don't know. Just because you're wealthy doesn't mean that you lack I mean, moral I don't, values I mean, and ethics. <laughs> They stole from another rich person, and the other rich person wouldn't miss it. But I mean, still, right, right, you, right. You, you, you're rich. Why do you need to steal? But, but they do. They steal from us all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's not a limit that's enough for some people. I mean, I think, you know, there are some people that I know and have known in my life that, you know, attained a certain level of success and comfort, and then they stop seeking more, you know? And I think that actually a lot of people are kind of like that um, in terms of there's this tendency for some people, and it's of course the people who benefit the most from this kind of thinking that say it the most, um, to say that everybody's greedy like this. But actually most of the people that I know, like I said, will obtain some level of comfort. And sure, there's an extent to which that, you know, always needing a little bit more aspect of capitalism can get to everyone from time to time. But for the most part, they'll just kind of chill, you know, they'll make their 50,000, 60,000, 100,000, you know, $150,000 a year or whatever. And they'll just vibe because that's a lot of money and they're doing great. And I think actually more people are like that, but not not the ultra wealthy. It's not like that for them. There is no point. It doesn't matter how much money you put in front of them. You could put an amount of money that in front of any normal person, you hand it to them and they go, okay, I'm, goodbye. I live on an island. I'm retired. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, and, and they would go, oh, dang, that's awesome. That's, 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 that, that'll put another bump on the account. Let's keep going. When's the next payment? You know, and they just don't, it's never enough. What if rich people are the real super predators? Mm. <laughs> well, I mean, I feel strongly about this topic too. And I think that, um, you know, when I was younger, I was going to like, I was going to grow up. I was going to have lots of money. I was going to have a two car garage and um, I was going to have a, an amazing career and live happily ever after. And my script didn't go that way. And for me on my own personal journey over the years, um, not because I took any oath to poverty, um, I just felt like I didn't need a bunch of things. Um, and I, you know, came to understand that I could be incredibly resourceful um, if I did without a lot of things. Uh, so, I've done without a lot of things. And it's also kept my anger very sharp. <laughs> uh, because sometimes I get really pissed off about having to share, you know, um, the last few cans of food or whatever in my house uh, with other people when, you know, I've got a massive list of people <laughs> that I know from around the entire country um, that have a hard time just even coming off of $25 or 20 bucks. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, but that's, you know, the world that all of us grew up in, right? Um, that somehow we need all of this material stuff or um, we're failures 
And with little kids, um, little kids would much rather talk about um, uh, a bunch of other kinds of oppressions, but they don't want to talk about the fact that their parents can't pay their rent and they're on the verge of becoming homeless um, or that they didn't eat today. Uh, and somehow or another, we've got to change that way of thinking that people are not individual failures, that we have a system that has failed us. And, um, uh, you know, the only way we're going to, you know, take the right road and not have, you know, like Walmart <laughs> decide um, the, the fight that's going to happen in this country is um, if we you know, begin to come together and, uh, you know, say we're not going to take their dirty money and we're going to be creative and we're going to work our ass off. We don't care, you know, how many bake sales or whatever we got to do, um, but we're going to support each other's work. We're going to do something different. Um, we're going to care about independent media and independent podcasts and we're going to share them and, you know, if somebody's homeless, we're going to house them. If somebody's hungry, we're going to together, we're going to figure out how to feed them. Um, and I think uh, once we began to feed, clothe, and house our army in this country, uh, then people can begin to ask larger questions. Um, like, why does any of this exist in the first place? And is the system a system that we have to get rid of that's killing everybody? or not and not just here in this country around the world well and the places where people are better off than, than are still better off than us are backsliding they're getting more like us the places where people are worse off than us we're killing everybody mm -hmm. uh and here we're we have the we're leading the world in vaccinations mm -hmm. And we've been passed by other countries since, but not too long ago, we were leading the world in COVID deaths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we were leading the world in COVID deaths despite countries like China and, and India having bigger problems now because initially we did the least to try to control it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only other country that was as bad as we were as far as policy was Sweden, where they, oh, we're, we're, we're just going to, we're just going to let herd immunity take care of everything. Mm -hmm. it, it, it turns out that it may not act, that having it may not actually make you immune for one thing, but, but they tried and they stopped that policy because everybody was well not everybody but you know what i mean people were dying in very large numbers and they didn't have to mm -hmm. and it takes me back to to another point about numbers because you said abundance mm -hmm. and the reason people are able to squat is that on average mm -hmm. on average mm -hmm. so that means there are places with more than this but most major urban centers in this country have, uh, you know, four, five, six empty homes for every homeless person, sometimes more. It's worth noting, too, that that's homes, because yeah. when uh, I was doing punk squatting with the anarchists here in Albuquerque in my early 20s and late teens, uh, we were often taking over corporate buildings that were disused. Mm -hmm. Because we found those um, were rarely checked on at all <laughs> here, and and that we could move people into them safely, sometimes for a year or more before anyone would notice mm -hmm. at all. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I I think that 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 home statistic is 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 startling and important, but it's it's worth noting that there's even more empty space than oh, yeah. that out there. There's so much empty space in every city because there's always these retail shopping spaces that are just sitting vacant that you drive past and they've been vacant for years. Everyone has these in their town. Mm -hmm. 
We've taken over abandoned churches, hotels, um, a flour mill in, in the Twin Cities, a hotel, um, you name it. There, there's so much um, and there's absolutely no reason for anybody uh, to be out on the streets. And we just feed into this whole thing around like, uh, you know, teaching people to adjust to a lower standard of living, teaching people to wait on waiting lists, um, teaching people that uh, things are going to be changed in the, you know, halls of Congress. And, you know, homelessness is like a gaping wound. You got to address it. You got to address it now. And we shouldn't expect somebody else to address it in a different way um, than what we would want to do with ourselves and our family. So, um, you know, I just want to encourage people, um, you know, we're on a mission uh, to end homelessness in our lifetime. If you want to know how to take over abandoned properties across this entire country, we're here. We will teach you. We will go there. We will do the Zooms. We will do whatever we can. Uh, when they come to get us, we hope that people will be there. Well, and I, I think the more people support your group and groups like it, the better off we are all going to be. Because we have to be our own heroes. There's not some Superman coming in to, to fly in and save us. And while that awful that awful movie was about that awful movie was about saving the schools, what it what it really what it really comes down to is you know we have to we have to save ourselves. I hate it when I can't talk. We have to, to save ourselves if we want to to be saved. Nobody's going to save us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me make sure this works. There it is. There is the website. No, 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 no. They've never done that to me before. <laughs> no. Periscope, which is the app that, uh, and I want everybody to hear this. Periscope, the app that Twitter uses to manage its videos and chats, is blocking www.poorpeoplesarmy.com as probably, as, as, as uh, spam. Wow. Now, I'm going to try again to see if it does that again, but this has never happened to me before. I've put all sorts of people's websites. This stuff's happening yeah. more and more, though. You know, my viral now tweet the other day no. got conveniently labeled as sensitive material, right, as it, it was getting hot. It goes through on YouTube. It goes through on YouTube. But Twitter blocks it as spam. Um, that's really important that that everybody hear that. <laughs> www.poorpeoplesarmy.com. Uh, yes, we are being blocked on Twitter. It makes total sense. Wow. <sighs> that <laughs> the first time that, and I mean politicians' websites. And I don't mean to discredit our our, our former guest. The, the the revolutionary people's movement is doing great work, and you should support them if you are supporting them. But we had a guest who was literally a guy who wrote up a manifesto for a general strike on his own and put it out there, and they didn't block his website but they're blocking this one. This is the only website that's ever been blocked for me since I've been doing these streams. Wow. And I'll point out to anyone who watched that episode that this kind of work is exactly what I said we'd need to get done to make a general strike actually possible. <laughs> I do. I do indeed. There's a reason all this stuff fits together like this.
-hmm. Yeah, so if people that are watching this could share, share this as much as they possibly can and, you know, um, raise your, um, uh, you know, <laughs> raise your voice that Twitter is uh, blocking this. Um, and uh, yeah, Shimako, who was just here, um, is furious <laughs> that this is happening. I'm pretty furious too. Um, it went through on YouTube. If you check this out on YouTube, you will see the link pop up in the chat near the end of the show. So don't be afraid to go to YouTube if you want to get the link. But Twitter's blocking it. And I'm I'm going to be sharing this with folks. Um, so does anybody else have any final thoughts before I give mine and close us out? No, I would just lift up again. Folks, go to www.poorpeoplesarmy.com. Share it. Help us try to figure out how to get it out to the people. Because if they're, if people are homeless, link up with us. We will make sure that you get housed. And I fully support taking empty buildings and living in them. I fully support other people doing that or joining up with Sherry's organization to help people do that. If you have a local organization, join up with them. This is everybody deserves a home and there is no reason for anything, any buildings to be standing empty right now when we have a homeless problem. And we would have a homeless problem if even one person was homeless. I will say one last thing. Uh, it's not just about housing people too. There's opportunities when you make space available. Um, and something that we, you know, used to be able to do uh, back when the squatting scene was very alive here was give food away. We used to help people start little businesses for themselves. We used to do all kinds of things, put on concerts, you know, do all kinds of things in the, these squatting spaces that benefited the community in various kinds of ways. And, you know, that stuff's valuable, too, because, like, we're all increasingly being denied anywhere to go. Um, and uh, it's hard to deal with that sometimes, depending on your situation. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in this stuff. It's, 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 it's vast. It's broad. There's so many ways that um, being willing to sort of uh, step forward and take a somewhat revolutionary act of defiance uh, of this type can really do a lot for your community that you might not expect. And I think it's really important that you, you take this seriously if you happen to watch this today. Take back the comments. And for Thank those you for having me on. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. We're very, uh, this is exactly what I want to share with people. So thank you so much. Thank you, guys. You thank have a you. great night. You too. And everybody, I'll tweet at you. You guys have a great night too. <laughs>